My name is Rick Renner, and I'm seated in Moscow in front of the Tchaikovsky Music Conservatory, which is in the very heart of Moscow, Russia. And behind me, there is a statue of Tchaikovsky. I'm sure that you're familiar with Tchaikovsky. He wrote many notable works that you would be familiar with, like Sleeping Beauty, or how about The Nutcracker? Everybody seems to know The Nutcracker. Well, that was written by Tchaikovsky, and this conservatory is named in his honor. And in this conservatory, there are many famous musicians who teach as professors, and many famous musicians have graduated from this conservatory. We have members of our church that both teach here and members of our church who study here. They're professional, they're excellent musicians, and they're using their skills in the worship of God in our church here in the city of Moscow. In the Old Testament, David was so serious about praise and worship that he employed the use of wonderfully skilled musicians. And when you come to the New Testament, we find a lot about worship. Jesus sang songs with his disciples. He worshiped with them. And when you read the writings of the Apostle Paul, there is a remarkable thing. Paul quotes what is called hymnic literature. In fact, some scholars believe Paul quoted it as many as 30 times. He was literally quoting the lyrics to songs that were being sung by the early church. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, worship is a very important factor in the life of God's people. God inhabits the praises of His people. And if you want God's presence to powerfully inhabit your life, then you need to be a worshiper. God will come. He'll inhabit your praises. And today, I want to talk to you about the role of worship in your life. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. As I told you in the introduction, today we're going to be focusing on worship. We're looking at all the elements that you have to have in your life to become the Christian God wants you to be. Just like making a cake. When you make a cake, you have to have all the right ingredients. You've got to start with a basic cake mix. You've got to put in eggs and sugar. You've got to put in baking soda and baking powder. And finally, when the product is finished, you cover it with icing, which is so wonderful. That's a great cake. But what happens if you forget the eggs? Or what happens if you forget the sugar or the baking soda or the baking powder? You end up with a flop. Those eggs are required for consistency. The sugar is needed for taste. Every element is important. And it's the same way in our Christian lives. We need to have certain elements to make us turn out right as a Christian. Yes, we're saved by the grace of God, but then we have to add all the ingredients to make us what we need to be. And I've identified 10 ingredients that are required for you to turn out a strong, stable, mature believer. And that's what we're covering in these programs. And today we're going to be looking at the ingredient of worship. But I'm speaking to you from my series called 10 Things to Make Your Life Strong. It's a 15-part series based on these programs, and it discusses all the ingredients you need in your life for you to turn out as a strong, stable, mature believer. And it comes with a tremendous study guide. I just saw it. Wonderful Greek words, study notes, all kinds of points and principles. It is just terrific for you personally or to share with a friend or in a Bible study group. The back of the series says, what are the 10 ingredients required to make your life strong? To make a cake, you need certain basic ingredients. If a single component is missing, the whole project ends up a flop. Likewise, there are certain spiritual ingredients required for your life to turn out strong and for you to be stable. What are those ingredients? I cover all of them in this series and I want you to order it. I believe it will be good for you. Then we're also offering you my daily devotionals, Sparkling Gems from the Greek, Volume 1, and Sparkling Gems from the Greek, Volume 2. Let me tell you just a moment about these books. These books are truly remarkable. They're even amazing to me, and I wrote them. They are so loaded with revelation and amazing information from the Greek New Testament. In each one of these, there are 365 daily devotionals. So you don't read the whole book at once. You just read one piece every day 
But in every one of these devotionals, there are multitudes of Greek word studies. In this volume alone, volume one, there are a thousand Greek word studies. In this one, volume two, another additional thousand Greek word studies that are not covered in this one. So these books are just loaded. They really are treasures for the student who loves the Word of God. And if that's you, I want to encourage you to order these books. Order number one, order number two. If you already have number one, then order number two. If you don't have either, it doesn't matter which one you start with. Or order both of them. It would be great for your spiritual library. But today, let's jump right into the Word, and we're looking at the ingredient of worship. We've already seen that for us to turn out the way we want to be, we need to have the ingredient of a love for souls. Second, we saw that we have to have a passion for the Word of God. Third, we saw we have to have a passion for the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to be looking at having a passion for worship, a passion for worship. In the New Testament, we read that the church began with a song service. They were worshiping, they were praising God. Of course, that was their heritage. They were Jews. And from the very earliest time in the Old Testament, the Jewish people were worshiping, praising people. David set the standard for that. He passed it along to his son Solomon, who developed a whole system of praise and worship, and it became ingrained in the hearts of the Jewish people. And when the church began in Jerusalem, they were a singing, praising, worshiping church. And they got it from Jesus because Jesus also was a worshiper and Jesus is still a worshiper today. I'm going to show you that today in the end of the program. But stay with me today because you're going to learn something brand new from the Word of God. But we're going to begin in Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and verse 47, where Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, is telling us about the environment of the early church. Listen to what he says in verse 46. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Now listen to how verse 47 begins. Praising God. They were praising. They were singing. They were worshiping. They were a praising, worshiping church. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added daily such as should be saved. Worshiping was a part of the early church from its very inception. Now, where did the apostles learn to do this? They learned it from Jesus. I've told you in previous programs that in the beginning they were not called apostles, they were called disciples. That word disciples is the Greek word methetes. The word methetes is a specific word which describes a student who is completely submitted to the authority of his master completely submitted to the authority of his master. And the student's job is to replicate everything that he sees his master do. Well, that's what the disciples did for three years. They were submitted completely to Jesus and replicated everything he did. They preached like he preached. They healed like he healed. They cast out demons like he cast out demons. Their job was to be submitted completely to his authority. They called him master, they called him Lord and to replicate everything he did. Well, when the church began in Acts chapter two, they just continued replicating. They were apostles now, but they were still disciples, still submitted to Jesus, still doing what he did, and they immediately began to pass something to the church, which they took from Jesus, and that was singing, praising, and worshiping. When they were with Jesus, they regularly worshiped, they sang, and they praised the Father. We can even read about this in Mark chapter 14, verse 26, and Matthew 26, verse 30, where both verses say, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus and his disciples, that evening when he had served them communion, before they went out to the Mount of Olives, they gathered together in the upper room, and they began to worship together because they were a worshiping group. This is so very important. Well, in the Old Testament, we read that David and Solomon put all their best efforts into praise and worship, and it became a model for the Jewish people, which we then saw was passed on to the New Testament church, and it became a model for the New Testament church and the church beyond throughout all of history. The word worship 
in the Greek New Testament is the Greek word proskuneo. Now listen very carefully. Today I'm going to be reading from my notes because I have a lot of information that I believe will be new to you. The word worship in Greek is the Greek word proskuneo, which means to worship, to adore, to fall forward on one's knees, and to kiss. It is a depiction of intimate adoration. It literally means to fall on the knees as an expression of reverence, to prostrate yourself, whether physically or mentally, in front of God to worship or to make supplication. Or as I said, it means to show intimate adoration. This word worship is a very intimate word, proskuneo, to fall forward on the knees and to kiss. It is entering into a time of intimacy with God. That is what the word worship, the Greek word proskuneo, means. That is amazing to me. Let me ask you, are your times of worship intimate? Are they moments when you and your heart are falling before God and blowing kisses at God? It should be a time of intimacy with the Father. That is exactly what the word worship means. In Psalm 22, verse 3, we have a promise. The verse says, that God inhabits the praises of his people. Here is a direct quote from the verse. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Let's focus on that word inhabitus, inhabit. The word inhabit describes the presence of God literally sitting on top of a congregation or the presence of God literally sitting on top of a believer who's praising and worshiping. One translation says, you sit enthroned on the praises of Israel. And here's what we find as a church or a person, or a person, this could be you, enters into a time of worship. That worship creates an atmosphere so wonderful that God comes, His supernatural presence, and God literally sits on top of that congregation or God sits on top of the praise and the worship of that individual because He feels so welcomed and so honored. When this occurs, the glory of God comes into a believer's life. Oh, this is amazing. Here you are worshiping God, and as you worship God, God is so honored and so welcomed by your worship that God comes, His presence comes, He literally sits enthroned on top of your praise, on top of your worship, and when God comes like that, His glory comes, and guess what? When God's glory comes, it comes with everything good that you need in your life. In fact, the word glory in the Old Testament is a specific Hebrew word which describes the idea of heaviness and weight. It literally describes the heavy and weighty presence of God, a presence that is loaded with everything good and needed to change and transform us. In that presence of God are miracles, healing, deliverance, personal inward changes, everything we need. It is all in that glory. That glory is heavy. It is weighty with everything good that we need to change and to transform us. That's the meaning of the word glory in the Old Testament. But when you come to the New Testament, there's an additional meaning. Because in the New Testament, the word glory now describes something that carries discernment, judgment, and splendor. Judgment, discernment, and splendor. And when you combine together both the Old and the New Testament concepts of glory, here's what you find. The combined usage of these Old and New Testament words tells us that when the glory of God comes, it is heavy with everything we need. And when the glory of God is there, listen to this. When the glory of God is there, it begins discerning everything that is needed. It begins to discern it. And suddenly the glory of God begins to judge what needs to be met, what answers need to be answered, who needs to be healed. And that heavy glory of God, loaded with everything good, begins discerning where all the needs are. And supernaturally, people begin to receive what they need from God coming from the overwhelming, heavy, weighty presence of God that is sitting on top of us because of our worship. That's what happens when we enter into a time of worship. God sits enthroned, and when God sits enthroned upon our worship, His glory manifests, 
That glory is manifested with everything you need. It's heavy, loaded with every good thing. And that glory of God then supernaturally begins to discern every need in your life or the need in the congregation. It begins judging or separating. And then it begins manifesting in a splendorous way to meet every need in the congregation. That is just amazing. And the best example of this is from Psalm 132, verse 3, where David describes the anointing as the dew of Mount Hermon. Very interesting and important verse. Listen to what it says. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head, he's describing the anointing, that ran down the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down the skirts of his garments. Then listen to what he says in verse 3. As the dew of Hermon, as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Here's what happens. When we worship as a people, or when you worship as an individual, you come into a place of marvelous unity. You're worshiping, God's presence comes, the glory of God comes. But what is the exact moment, the split second, when that glory of God begins discerning and judging and dividing and meeting the needs in the congregation? Well, these verses tell us. In a moment of unity, when we get into unity, there the Lord bestows His blessing. And the Bible describes it as the dew of Mount Hermon. So you have to think about dew. What is dew? Well, dew is moisture that is in the air. But if the atmospheric conditions are correct, if the criteria is met, suddenly the moisture that is in the air, you can't see it. It's in the air. It's there. You can't see it. But if the atmospheric conditions become right, suddenly the moisture that is in the air that is invisible appears as droplets of water on everything. Everything is covered by dew. And now David says this is like the anointing of God. When we worship and we get into a place of unity, suddenly we meet the criteria. The atmosphere changes and the anointing, the glory of God that is in the atmosphere, which we cannot see with our eyes, when we meet the criteria, suddenly it begins to show up everywhere. I love this when it happens in a congregation because suddenly the glory, the anointing that is in the atmosphere manifests in the entire church. It's like a corporate anointing. Everywhere you look, people are getting touched by the presence of God. That's because we have met the criteria in worship and in unity. Isn't that powerful? That is amazing. Well, let's jump to the New Testament. In the New Testament, we find that there are many examples of actual songs that were sung by the early church. In fact, some scholars speculate there could be as many 30 examples of songs cited in the writings of the New Testament, but I'm going to give you four that are unquestionably quotes from Psalms. Songs. Now, you're going to be surprised. When Paul wrote these verses, it was the equivalent of saying, hey, I know how to tell you this truth. Let me quote the lyrics to that song you sing in your church. And Paul begins to quote lyrics to songs. And these particular four texts are called hymnic literature. These are literal songs which were sung by the early church. Ephesians 5.14, a verse about God's awakening power. It says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Those are the words to a real song sung by the early church. Or how about Colossians 1, 15 to 20, these marvelous verses about the divinity of Jesus. Here's what it says. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or things all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Those wonderful verses are verses from a song that was sung by the early church. That is hymnic literature. Or how about Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10? Some of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. 
Listen to what it says. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Those are words to a song that was sung by the early church. I can just hear them singing the song. Therefore God has highly exalted him. These were the words to a song. Or how about 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13? It's a promise that those who suffer will experience divine glory. Listen to what the words say. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abides faithful, he cannot deny himself. These are the words to a song. That is amazing. So we have the actual words to songs sung by the early church in Ephesians 5.14, Colossians 1, 15 to 20, Philippians 2, 9 and 10, 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. But I want to read to you again what I've written in my notes. Some of Paul's letters actually contain quotes of songs that were sung in the early church. There are probably 30 cited in the New Testament. I've read just four, but there are probably 30 of them. Now that is truly remarkable. Wow. But wait, there's more. There's more evidence of singing and worshiping in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, we've already seen, the Bible says, day by day, as they spent time together in the temple, they broke bread at home, they ate their food with gladness and generous hearts. I really like that translation. Praising God. They were praising God. Or how about Acts 16, verse 25? About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They were in prison, and they knew they better worship. They needed the presence of God to come. They needed that glory loaded with everything good to manifest, to sit on top of them, and begin to meet their need. That's what the glory of God does. And the Bible says the prisoners were listening to them, which means they were worshiping so loudly everyone in the prison could hear them worshiping. And what happened? An earthquake took place that set them free. You see, the glory of God came. It sat on top of them. It was heavy with everything they needed. And it discerned they needed to be set free. So they got an earthquake out of that marvelous glory. That's what happens when you begin to worship God. And that's why... It is vital for this to be an ingredient in your personal mix. Now, we're out of time, but we're just getting started on this subject. And when we come back tomorrow, we're going to continue. Please don't miss it, because tomorrow also is loaded with revelation and information about this ingredient, having a passion for worship. I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. To make a cake, you need specific ingredients. But if one ingredient is off, the whole thing can end up a disaster. Likewise, there are spiritual ingredients necessary for a strong and stable life of faith. In the series, 10 Things to Make Your Life Strong, Rick Renner covers the 10 essential ingredients required for an unwavering faith-filled life. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $24, you'll learn how to cultivate a life of prayer. In addition to this teaching series, you can also get the book Sparkling Gems from the Greek Volumes 1 and 2. In these books, Rick unlocks the brilliant treasures within God's Word and shows you how to live an intimate, uncompromising life with God. Each volume of Sparkling Gems explores more than 1,000 in-depth Greek word studies. Sparkling Gems 1 for just $40 and Sparkling Gems 2 for only $45. Order one, two, or all three of these resources today. Call now, 1-800-742-5593 or go to renner.org to order. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia, and I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. Your support has allowed us to help special needs children in Russia. Because of you, we are able to help children with disabilities. Because of your gifts, we are able to give them attention and care. We're even able to provide outings for their parents, where they can enjoy their children as a family with no worries or concerns. Your gifts have lifted their burdens. Often children with disabilities don't leave their apartments for extended periods due to the difficulty of getting around this mega city of Moscow. So when they come to an event especially designed for them, it is a truly special time. Several times a year, we put on a children's musical 
that are based on Bible stories so these children can learn about God's Word and His great love for them. Parents and grandparents who accompany them fill the church in anticipation for this outreach. When you give to Renner Ministries, you can bring joy to these children and give them the hope of God's Word. It happens because of the support of partners. But there are so many more that need your help. Will you consider joining us as a partner today so we can continue helping these beautiful children? Without your support, we simply cannot do this. Please call or go online right now. When generous, caring people like you give, we are able to give these children with special needs the care and attention they need so desperately. Call 1-800-742-5593 or go online to renner.org to show your support. Through your donations of any size, we can continue to make a huge difference in these children's lives. I'm so glad you've been with me today. We're looking at the ingredient of worship. Worship is very important to have in your personal mix so you become the Christian God wants you to be. We've already seen that you need to have a passion for souls. Oh, it is so important. You need to have a passion for the Bible, a passion for the teaching of the Word of God. You need to have a passion for the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in your church. And now we've seen that you have to add the ingredient of worship to your personal life for you to turn out the strong Christian that God wants you to be. That word worship we saw today is the Greek word proskuneo, which literally means to fall forward on the knees and to kiss. It describes a time of intimate worship. And we've seen that when we begin to worship, the glory of God literally comes and sits enthroned on top of us. And that glory of God is heavy with everything we need. It's heavy with signs, wonders, miracles, funds, prosperity, healing, everything we need, peace. The glory of God contains everything. And when we meet the right conditions, that glory then begins to manifest like dew. It shows up and it begins meeting our needs. Oh, it's just powerful. I can't wait to get back tomorrow to continue this subject. But I want to remind you that we're offering you my devotionals, sparkling gems from the Greek. If you don't have one of these, order today or order both. And remember that we're also offering you my series called 10 Things to Make Your Life Strong. I believe this series will really make a difference in your life. But let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for the ingredient of worship. Father, I pray for people today who really don't have a heart for worship. Give them a heart for worship. And Lord, I pray that your glory will come with everything they need to meet their need as you sit enthroned on their praise and worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. God's word is amazing. So let it release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity.